Now you'll notice that as we describe data processing, I'm also implementing a lot of methods with special names. That's because Python has particularly strong support for implicit sequences. And so I'm showing you how the Python language chose to implement these features. Of course, they get implemented in slightly different ways in lots of different programming languages. And sometimes you have to build out these ideas yourself. But since they're part of the Python language, we're going to continue to understand the Python implementation of these ideas. And the next we'll look at is a concept called an iterator. Now an iterator is an object that lets you walk through some elements in a sequential data set in some order. So the iterator interface is part of the Python language, but also shows up in lots of other programming languages. And it just gives you a view into the sequential data set that lets you walk through step by step to each element. So it's an object that can provide the next element of a sequence over and over and over again until you get from wherever you started to wherever you're going to end up. And the way this is implemented in Python is with a special method name called next with underscores. So this next method of an iterator returns the next element of the underlying sequence that you're iterating over. So the iterator's job is to remember where you are in the sequence so that it can give you the next element over and over again. Then paired with the next special method, there's a built-in next function Notice no underscores this time, which you call on any object, and all it does is invoke the next method on its argument. So this function, which is a built-in function, and this special method name have a very similar relationship to len or repr, where the function just invokes a method on its argument. Now, Part of the specification of what next does is to handle the case where there is no next element. When there's no next element, the next method of an iterator should raise a special kind of exception called stop iteration, which is a built-in exception class. So conceptually, if we have a range and then we want an iterator over that range, that's something that's going to give us each element in turn. We can get this by calling the built-in iter function, which just invokes a special method iter on its argument. When you call iter on some sequence or anything that's representing a sequential data set, then that's going to return an iterator object. An iterator object is something that has a next method. And the range iterator in particular remembers where you are so what elements you're going to return next. And then you can call the built-in next function, which just invokes the next method on this range iterator object, which advances the marker that remembers what's next. So it will return negative two from next, and we'll remember that the next thing you're gonna do is negative one. If I call next again, I'll get negative one. If I call it again, I'll get zero. If I call it again, then I'll get one. And then, if I call it one more time, it will raise a stop iteration exception. Let's see how this works. Okay, so x is a range from negative 2 to 2. Let's say xi is what I get when I call iter on x. So xi is a range iterator object. xi is something that has a next method. And when I invoke next, I'll get the next thing in the sequence, which is negative two. And if I do it again, I'll get negative one. So notice that xi is changing. X is not changing. It still represents this sequential data set. But xi is a marker into that data set telling us what comes next. And since we've invoked next twice, the thing after that will be zero. You get the same effect by calling the built-in next function, which will give us one. And if I call it one more time, then I'm going to raise stop iteration. And every time I call it after that, I will get stop iteration. So this says I've reached the end of the range. There's no way I can get more elements out of it.
The only way I can start over is to create a new range. So I can create um, XI again by just building a new range iterator, at which point I can start walking through the sequence anew. Okay, so let's see if we can build that. We want a class range iter, which is an iterator over a range. In order to create an iteration over a range, we still need a start and an end. But what we're going to store is what element will come next. The first one is start. And then we need to remember when we're going to end. And so we'll keep that around too. Now our range iter is different from a sequence in that instead of having len and get item, it just has a method next, which returns the next element in the sequence. So that would be um, the result of this call will be self.next. Now what next also needs to do is advance the iterator. So it needs to actually update the next attribute of the range iter called self to be one more than it was before. And then we can return the result. Now the only thing we've forgotten is what happens if we've already reached the end. So how do we know? Well, we know if it's the case that self.next is greater than or equal to the end of the range, then we should just raise stop iteration. Okay, so we have x. Let's have xi is iter of x. We have y is the range that we created. And let's create yi as the range iter from negative 2 to 2. And make sure these two things behave similarly. Uh, so xi is a range iter, rater, yi is the one that I created. If I get xi next, then I'll get negative 2 and then negative 1. And similarly, if I invoke next on yi, I'll get negative 2 and negative 1. Calling next i has similar behavior until I get to the end. And calling next on yi should give us exactly the same behavior. Now the stack trace is a little bit different because this is a built-in, um, because this one is built-in type, whereas this one is something that I created as a user, but that doesn't matter. What matters is that stop iteration is used in both cases. So we've created our first iterator.